today we're going to continue with Aaron's uh, talking about the software, the trend screen in particular, and we're going to get into some of the session settings and uh, other things that other than, you know, like uh, you see on the top of the screen, the entrainment and the screen thing. So we're going to try and get those things covered today. So Aaron, thanks again for your work on this. Uh, I think Wednesday was great. I know we recorded it and you'll get it posted. Mm -hmm. We will record today's and get it posted. So the show is yours. Thank you, Rob. Uh, before we get into anything new is there any burning questions anybody has about anything on the screen when you're training before we jump into a topic okay i think they're all ears yep <laughs> all right so uh the last one for those of you that maybe weren't here wednesday you know we covered all the metrics, the ratios there at the bottom of the screen, we talked about success percentage and target percentage and auto versus manual. Um, so for today, we're gonna kind of run across the top of the screen there. Um, you know, we'll start just left to right from entrainment and we'll finish off in session settings. And if anybody's got any questions along the way, just mute yourself and ask away. Um, so let's start uh, with entrainment. Um, so for those of you maybe that aren't fully aware of even what this is, so entrainment is photic entrainment. So the use of photic light glasses um, in conjunction with neurofeedback. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit on Wednesday. Um, you know, as far as we were talking about running an asymmetry protocol like 18 or 20, and how sometimes we notice that, you know, beta shifts pretty easy back to the left hemisphere as being dominant amplitude there. Uh, but sometimes in a lot of clients, alpha can be a little stubborn to get that to increase back in the right hemisphere where we want it. And the use of photic light can enhance that. Um, you know, so we can, you know, actually push a 10 hertz frequency into the left eye field, stimulating the right hemisphere, and give the brain that little extra helping hand it needs to kind of get that alpha up higher in the right than in the left. Now, the beautiful thing about the way our developers engineered this software, you know, is it's always been about simplicity, you know. Um, you know, we strive to be kind of a company that is producing software by clinicians for clinicians, you know, so less stuff we have to make you do or remember to do at the start of a session, hopefully the easier your life is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so first of all, in the entrainment uh, menu, you're going to notice we have a left side, so that's left eye field. And as uh, many of you are aware, and if you're not, um, you know, the optic nerves do cross over. So uh, we've got a left and a right um, nerve receptor at the back of each eye. Um, the left eye field connects back. And uh, so you get the optic nerve from the left eye field, crosses over, terminates at O2 on the right side of the brain. Um, and then we have right eye side or right side, which is right eye field. That optic nerve is going to cross over and terminate at O1 on the left side. And we've kind of put that in here so everyone kind of knows that this is saying left side but right hemisphere. So in this case, uh, this is a protocol four. So we've got 14 hertz going into the left eye field stimulating the right hemisphere and in uh, 16 hertz going into the right eye field stimulating the left hemisphere. So Dr. Suter spent a lot of time um, in the beginning of all of this, uh, determining which frequencies seem to bring about the best outcomes. Um, now, as I mentioned on Wednesday, you know, I've, I've been around photic now, it's based my whole career in neurofeedback, so over about 15 years. Um, I stand behind it wholeheartedly. I, I think it's a great addition to neurofeedback. Um, now, you know, with that being said, you know, we still can do neurofeedback without it. It's not the end all be all. 
um, but it is an enhancement, no different than doing HRV prior to sessions or any other modalities you incorporate in. This is just something else to help enhance the outcomes of neurofeedback. Um, one thing I do love about the way our, our entrainment is set up is we can actually adjust these frequencies on the fly while a client trains. Now, the last um, company I worked for, you know, the Photic software was completely separate. You know, so you would lock in your frequencies before the start of a session and you could not change them, you know, without closing everything down and starting over. Um, I really love the fact that now with, with the new mind software, I actually have the ability to tweak these settings slightly. I don't go crazy because um, I know Dr. Suter spent a lot of time kind of dialing these in, but we all know that each brain is an individual entity. They're all slightly different. And just because the majority of people responded best to like on this protocol four, a 14 on the left, a 16 on the right, does not necessarily mean that your client is gonna be an identical match to those people. Um, so let's say if we go back to that, that thought of using it, to encourage alpha back up in the right hemisphere if we're using a protocol 18 or 20. You know, it's it's set to generally 10 hertz. Now, there is that possibility that your client may respond better to 11 hertz you know, or 12 hertz. Um, so if you're using photic and you're and you're not seeing the frequency band potentially moving in the direction that you're intending it to move, um, you know, you can adjust these frequencies up and down while they train. So, you know, I could go to 17 hertz here and try that for a couple of minutes. I could try 18 hertz, you know, and during that time, I can be watching for change in my trend line. And do I see that it's increasing in amplitude anymore? Um, you know, if it's something like beta, of course, at, you know, a 20 microvolt scale, you know, you're not going to see beta really move much. So, you know, you might actually need to, you know, change that scaling, you know, blow up, blow it up and zoom in so you can actually see if there's an actual change. Um, or, you know, you can simply watch the average amplitude of your signals and see, do you, are you getting a slight increase or not? Um, so you can really tailor photic to each individual client um, so they get exactly what they need. Now, we do have um, some options for photic. So by default, it's set in this manual mode. Um, now, from today on, you know, if, if you can't remember what all these are, you can simply click on this little question mark icon, and we're gonna give you an explanation of what each one of these different options are. Um, so you would always have to start in manual mode though, um, because any of the other options, once you switch to uh, proportional or dichotomous, um, your brightness level is gonna be locked into wherever it was at when you started it up. Um, so if you're gonna use Photic, my suggestion would be to go ahead and click that start button after you plug the glasses into the port on the back left side of the amp. And then you can adjust the, the maximum brightness to that client's comfort level. You know, and I always like to stress with Photic, brighter is not better. You know, we've been dealing with a supersized society for decades now, you know, and everybody thinks, oh, you know, to get the best benefits out of these photic lights, you know, I need to turn them up to psychedelic mode. You know, no, I need no, them. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All you're going to do if you turn them up too bright, you know, is you're potentially, number one, going to cause excessive artifact. You know, what's going to happen, you know, if you walk out from a movie theater, you know, into the bright sunlight, you squint, you know, mm -hmm. that natural act of squinting, you know, is going to tighten up all the muscles across the forehead. You're going to get excess of tension, F7, F8, FP1, FP2, potentially F3, F4. So your whole frontal area 
is just going to be just solid artifact. So we just want to find a comfortable level for the client. Um, you know, and, and of course, if, if they're up too bright, you know, they're potentially going to get a headache even. So I'm going to set this to wherever the client says, yeah, that's, that's comfortable. You know, I like that. Now, once I find their brightness. Can I add a comment to that, Aaron? Sure can, Rob. Because people have those sensi various sensitivities, as you're noting, I've always taken that down to like 1% start the session and then I slowly move it up and I tell them, tell me when this feels comfortable to you. I don't, it doesn't need to be highly bright as long as you're seeing, you know, the, the flashes, but let me know what the comfortable brightness is. So then you can go up and down with it until they say, oh, I like it at four or I like it at seven or what have you. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Now, we, we would prefer not to just stay in manual mode. So the manual is just gonna keep it at a consistent brightness, consistent frequencies. Um, there are more advanced settings that we can use. Now, based off conversations Dr. Suter and I have had, he's done the research over the years on all of this. And the research tells us that a proportional form of feedback is gonna be the most powerful way to provide feedback for a client. Now, for all of you that aren't aware of this, all of our feedback is proportional. Screen fading is proportional, audio fading is proportional. Um, and what does that mean? You know, what is proportional versus, you know, maybe the next option, which is dichotomous. So a, a proportional is gonna slowly ramp things up and down through the feedback process. So you'll notice like when your clients are training, especially if they're doing eyes open with screen fading, you're gonna notice that that screen fading is not just a bright or a dim or a bright or a dim. You know, it is steadily getting darker and steadily getting brighter and it's stepping through the ranges. Um, and that is all tied back into your thresholds. You know, so as, you know, if let's say they're all green, they're all in a past state, then, you know, the the fading of the screen is going to be as bright as it can be. And in, as far as photic is concerned, the brightness will be as bright as the client said in the beginning that they'd like to see it at. Now, as each threshold goes into a fail state or red, now we are slowly taking away more and more and more. You know, so it's going to start with all of them in a past state as the bright as it can be. As one fails, we're gonna take away a little bit of the brightness. As two fail, we're gonna take away more. If they get a fail on all four, then they're gonna be, the, as far as photic concerns, they're gonna be as dim as possible. Um, same goes with your screen fading or even your audio fading. You know, we're stepping it up and down and that has been shown through research to be the most powerful way of providing feedback um, to your clients. Now we do have other options. Um, we have dichotomous, and if we kind of look at the definition of dichotomous, you know, we can see that it says the photic stimulation will initiate as the training threshold is exceeded. So what does that mean? So that means it's an on or an off style of situation. So it's not gonna be really ramping anything up or down, it's gonna be more of an on or off situation. And you can see that here where the brightness is down at zero, you know, because we have some of these thresholds in a fail situation, you know, so they're gonna to have to get it into a pass situation and hold it there, you know, before we actually activate that photic. Um, and then we have one additional option that is alternating an alternating uh, photic will shift back and forth ryth rhythmically from the left to the right visual field um, in one second intervals. Um, so in the past, you know, dealing with photic, um, you know, we the company I used to be with, uh, we worked with some chiropractic neurologists, um, you know, who were doing you know a lot of work with like TBI cases. You know, and that's one of the things in their neurology training that, 
you know, they wanted to implement in Photic was this ability to, you know, stimulate the left hemisphere on its own for a minute and then switch over and do the right, you know, and kind of get each hemisphere kind of separated from one another. Um, now that, you know, as far as my knowledge, you know, that's kind of, I think, where I might incorporate the alternating. Um, Dr. Suter and Rob, if you've got any other input on when somebody may want to use alternating other than that. Um, yeah, EMDR. EMDR. Thank you, Dr. Suter. Yeah, we got requests for that from the EM, people who practice EMDR, and they okay. wanted to have that option in there, too. Good to know. Thank you. Um, now, I have noticed there are some clients that, you know, we want to try to do this proportional, but for whatever reason, the way their system is built, it gets highly annoying to them. Um, you know, so just because, you know, we know the research says it's the most powerful, doesn't mean we're going to use it if that's the case. You know, if, if something's annoying the client, you know, I think of that as negative operant conditioning. You know, are they still going to benefit? Yeah. Are they going to benefit the best they possibly could? No. You know, we really want to kind of use that positive operant conditioning on people. You know, so if they tell me proportional, like the, the change in the brightness of the glasses is annoying, um, you know, because they're also getting maybe a change in the screen brightness or a change in the volume, and it's just overwhelming their system, by all means, you know, just leave them on manual, you know, set a brightness to a comfortable level and, and don't exacerbate, you know, any situation. Yeah, especially with newer clients who are somewhat challenging to begin with, like we've discussed in some of the case reviews we've done here, where they're just really challenging to work with and having a hard time sitting still or having a hard time with this, or I don't like the video, or I don't, you know, those ones, yeah, I think that you're, that's great advice. <laughs> don't push it. Now, you know, for those of you that are, are have never done photic, and now you're starting to think, well, maybe I, I want to try this. You know, I hear a lot of people saying it, it offers great benefits. You know, I just want to stress that photic is not going to be for every single client. You know, one of the things I learned early on with photic is you've got about one in 40,000 roughly that are photic sensitive. Some of them know it, some of them don't. You know, so if you're going to implement photic with a new client, don't walk away. You know, once you start their session and the photic is running, you know, stay in the room, you know, for at least the first five minutes. You know, and and while we're waiting, we're we're waiting to hear them say anything negative. You know, hey, I something doesn't feel right. Oh, I'm getting a headache. Oh my lord, I'm getting nauseous. You know, what's going on? Um, those are all signs of photic sensitivity. You know, so immediate headaches. Um, vertigo, nausea, um, and it's worst, I've seen panic attacks. You know, I was actually at a conference, um, had hooked up um, a doctor, you know, for a sample session, put the photic on her, walked away, um, was talking with somebody, and it was about three minutes after they were sitting there. Next thing I know, I look over, and it was in one fell swoop. This doctor just ripped everything off her head, sensors, glasses, headphones, and shot up out of the chair and started walking out of the booth. You know, and I had to stop her and say, is everything OK? She said, oh, I was, you know, I can't remember exactly what her it was kind of a panic attack situation. Um, I said, oh, well, you're probably photic sensitive then. She says, yes, I am. I already knew that now why she chose to actually put the glasses on, knowing she was photic sensitive, she will only ever be able to answer that question. Um, you know, but those are possible things you may see. So you really wanna be observant the first time you use photic. If, if they don't have any problems, generally in the first five minutes, you're gonna be okay. Now I have run into clients though that first five minutes they were fine. Um, by the end of the session, they were fine. 
but on their next appointment when they came in i would always ask them the same question how did you do after your last session anything new you want to report and i've had a few clients over the years that said you know it was weird i got out of here i felt fine but it was like within a half an hour it was like i just got this raging headache you know and it was okay so that was a delayed you know potential effect um now it, it could have been something completely unrelated um you know but i'm one to err on the side of caution you know i'm probably assuming if, if this isn't something that that occurs to you normally you know if they don't get like sinus issues or anything else they don't have allergies they don't generally get headaches i'm probably going to think that they're mildly photic sensitive so just be aware of that um you know i would also suggest if you are incorporating photic in your practice um you know it's potentially add something into your intake paperwork asking them you know if they know if they're photic sensitive and also a very important question if you're going to use photic have you ever had a seizure ever you know so if somebody does have active seizures um photic very well could produce one in the middle of your office and i don't know about any of you but that's the last thing i ever want to happen um you know to a client you know um so i'm always making sure that i check in with them um you know make sure they've never had a seizure make sure they're not photic sensitive that they're aware of and then try it you know um never heard of anybody actually having a seizure that didn't previously have seizure activity um, so i've never been worried about you know that and that question does come up a lot well can it stimulate a seizure well not in my experience not unless they've had one in the past um, photic is not going to stimulate one um, if there's any questions on that feel free to ask i've got it i've just a couple of comments one you might ask them in terms of just sensitive have you ever been to places like a disco where you have strobe lights flashing and were you comfortable in that environment or not? I think of driving up in New York State, and Richard will appreciate this, and some of the older roads like the Bronx River Park where they have these metal guardrail dividers. And depending on the, how up or down you are sitting in your car, when you're, the, you're driving at night, those cars coming towards you, it's like the lights are flashing mm -hmm. off and on going between the two poles, you know. So something like that is a way to ask them. And the other thing I wanted to have you mention, too, if Newmont is still selling the um, infrared uh glasses remind people those go on top of the head not in front of the eyeballs <laughs> i don't know if we are i haven't heard anything about that dr Suter, do you know if that's still available yeah definitely okay. yeah. yeah and those are what the 810 nanometer irs is that what we're using i think they are i think they yeah. are yeah. you put them on top of the area you're training over the electrodes mm -hmm. somewhere in the brain it it'll, it does a very similar thing much like the helmets mm -hmm. or the v light and things like that folks but don't put those over somebody's eyes and tell them mm -hmm. the glasses <laughs> uh -uh. Yeah. yeah and i've i've used the 810 nanometer irs and mm -hmm. they're amazing you know yeah, i, me I too. 10 nanometer you know i've actually we've used them for people with shoulder pain knee pain um you know, on different actual body parts, you know, and yeah, there was a woman at a conference. We did a 20 minute um, with the glasses just draped over her knee. You know, That's we were hurt. using, yeah, we were up at, uh, in that case, we were running 80 to 100 hertz in a random yeah. pattern. Um, oh. But, you know, it was 20 minutes later, you know, we asked her to, to get up and come move to a different location and you know she was like oh you know it's you got to give me a minute i told you i've got a bad knee and she just stood straight up and started walking in this look of absolute astonishment and she's like i have no knee pain and yeah it's pretty powerful technology i mean i'm a firm believer in ir um it works really good too like you know if you're doing smr training you can push that 14 hertz through those 8 10 nanometers right over the motor strip you know and and help encourage all that um so the other options up here we're not going to spend a lot of time on these because they're not a lot to talk about 
Um, screen fading, of course, if we're doing eyes open training with a video, um, we're gonna need to use screen fading. Recommended darkness level would be generally 70 to 80%. Um, the software will automatically recognize if you have an external screen hooked up. So you can see here, which I do on this computer, um, it's automatically gonna put the screen fading on the client monitor, which would be monitor two. Um, so really simple, you, know, you just click your drop down, set your darkness level, click start, and that takes care of the screen fading. For eyes closed sessions with audio, we're gonna be fading the volume. Um, now, the minimum's pretty easy. You know, minimum is always going to be somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Now, for the maximum, this is the way I like to do it. Um, I I like to figure out a preset for this before I actually get them started. You know, so once I start their session and I've got their music started, I'm going to come down to the taskbar. I'm going to click on the volume icon. And then I'm going to start their music and I'm going to slowly start, you know, down here at maybe 10 or 15. And I'm going to start slowly bringing the volume up until the client tells me I've reached a comfortable level for them. You know, and maybe 78 here is their ideal happy place for volume. So I'm going to take that number 78 and I'm going to transfer it to the maximum slider up here. So now I know that during their session, the volume is never going to exceed the loudest that they said they were com they were comfortable listening to it at. Um, that's one way of doing it, you know, so now when you start um, your audio fading, what it's going to do is it's going to keep that volume slider, the master volume of the computer between those two numbers. And so it's going to keep it between the 10% and the 78% the whole time. Um, by doing that, I generally don't have a need to ever readjust the maximum slider. Um, now you can also just start this off a little bit lower, you know, get your minimum set, start their, their audio fading. Um, you know, and then ask them, is that loud enough? Would you like it louder? My experience is doing it that way, you're gonna spend way more time you know, trying to hit, you know, their comfort level. That's just my experience. Um, that may differ for you, um, but you can try it both ways. See what, you know, works best for you. Um, from there, uh, we've got the games option. Um, so games ties into Zucor games. You know, if we click on that, you'll see Zucor games there. Um, neurofeedback games, in my opinion, I I personally am not a huge fan of them. Um, you know, I grew up around video games. You know, I was in that. Generation X when you know I was a kid when the Ataris came out and the Commodore 64s and I've kind of grown up watching you know the evolution of, of video games and especially now we're in a virtual reality and it's just you know increasing day by day. And I will say Zucor games out of out of the games that are available to us for neurofeedback, you know, my opinion, I, I think they're probably the best out there as far as advancement. However, you know, if you've ever sat and watched the video games that these kids are playing today, they're ultra realistic. You know, these kids are being transported into a fantasy world that, you know, is visually stunning. You know, and the neurofeedback games are just not that. You know, they're very kind of static. The graphics are okay. They're not, you know, what in the gaming community they would consider like AAA style graphics. Um, you know, they're basic. And my experience is the kids are gonna get bored really quick with them. 
you know, and as soon as they lose focus and attention, they're not going to be training that well, you know, because if they get bored, they're going to potentially, eyes are going to be wandering around the room. They're not going to be paying attention. You know, and the one thing with a lot of the neurofeedback games is the client can't participate. Um, you know, so they don't have control over it physically. The only control they have is is through what their brain activity is doing. Um, now, that's not saying that I'm saying don't use games. I'm just saying personally, that's my opinion. I've heard that opinion from other people in the neurofeedback community, um, but I've also talked to cl to clinics that really love them. They think they're great. You know, so you can try them out for yourself to see what you think. Now, um, we have an arrangement, New Mind and Zucor Games have an arrangement that if you do want to try them, just email me um, or email somebody on our team. You can email Victoria as well. We've got a Word document we can send you where you can get two of their trial games. So you can get um, a trial of the carnival game and you can get a trial of the sports game. So you can try it out yourself. You can see what you think, you know, formulate your own opinion if you think that's gonna benefit anybody in your clinic. Um, and then if you do like them, you can contact uh, Zucor Games, you know, and or go on their website, you can purchase those um, and they tie right into your software. Um, you know, we've got everything integrated to work seamlessly with that. Um, so that is an available option, you know, if you'd like to to try that. And then uh, let's go ahead and move into the session settings. This is, I think, a menu not a lot of people venture into, and maybe it's because it intimidates them. They're not sure what these items are, um, and they're free to make any adjustments, um, which I'll I'll say for the most part. Um, the default settings we have, you know, are are going to be ideal in most cases, um, you know, to what your client's going to need. Uh, so we'll start at the top. So thermal update rate. So we've got that set at 100 milliseconds. That is these here. So these are thermos. I call them thresholds. Some people call them thermos. Um, same same thing but that's just how quick it updates so you know if i switch it over to like one second you're going to notice now they're kind of stuttering you know they're they're not fluidly moving a um, little bit too slow you know so the, the thermal update rate is not something i would really recommend um, adjusting um, you know dr Suter has worked with our development team you know, to put some ideal settings here, um, kind of norms across the field. Um, 100 milliseconds is is a good setting for the thermal update. The next is spectral update rate. Now, this will not adjust anything that we're visually looking at on the screen. Now, this affects the bin lines on our spectral display. You know, so we can see there that they're kind of moving slow. We've got to set at one second. Now I could change that to 100 milliseconds. Um, I don't know about any of you, but that doesn't, I can't get any information off that. I can't see what's what's being held up, what's staying dominant. You know, so again, that default setting at one second, I feel is good. My brain can can wrap its head around this. You know, I can see what's, what's moving dominant. Um, and that's all I really need, you know, to be able to see there. So I, I personally would not ever change the spectral update rate. Now the next two, um, you know, Rob and I were talking about this before the start of the webinar, and I know Rob loves using reward tones. Um, he talks about it, you know, on the lunch and learns quite a bit, um, you know, and basically these reward tones. You know, you've got the option of four different sounds. Um, information I've received from clinics, uh, a lot of people generally gravitate to low flute and viola. Um, you know, they're telling me that's 
the feedback they're getting from their clients that they appreciate those more than the Morris or the Xylophone. Um, it doesn't mean your client won't really dig the Morris over anything else. Um, you know, so you can try different ones to see what's going to appeal to your client the best. Um, and our reward latency, and I guess before I go on, um, the reward tones, we talked on Wednesday about the math behind the training efficiency. You know, that for them to increase this by a tenth of a point, um, they had to get a pass state or green on all of the thresholds to get this to increase by a tenth of a second. This reward latency works the same way. So for them to get a reward tone, they would need to get each one of the available thresholds on the screen into a pass state or green. And in this case, the latency is set to 500 milliseconds. So they would have to hold them all into a pass state to get that reward tone you know, for the 500 milliseconds. And that is a great setting for the standard two channel protocols with four thresholds. So any protocol that's recommended by the database, 500 milliseconds works really well. But a lot of us start um, with SMR training. And I know there's, some people do a, a two channel SMR at C3, C4. Some people are just doing a one channel um, SMR at CZ. And if you're only doing a one channel SMR up or any one channel that only has a single thermo or threshold, you will need to change that reward latency. Um, if you've got it set to 500 milliseconds and you're only training 13 to 15 up at CZ, it's gonna sound like a machine gun, you know, in their headphones or through the speakers. You know, because they're going to hold it up there. And if let's say they can hold 13 to 15 up for five seconds, you know, every 500 milliseconds that they hold it into the green, they're going to get that tone. So it's going to be ding, 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 ding. And it's probably going to drive them insane. Um, so, you know, this all came about actually at a clinic um, that called me about this. Like, I'm, I'm, adding in reward tones on a one channel SMR and my client is about ready to lose their mind, you know, because it just won't stop. And that's when I explained to him, I said, it, it's the latency that, that in the settings, you know, so click on session settings. And I told him, I said, increase that reward latency to one second and tell me what that does for you. You know, and he switched it over to one second. He's like, perfect. It's like, that's what I was going for. Um, so you may need to adjust these depending on what you're doing. Now, you know, we can apply that on the opposite end of the scale too. If you're doing a four channel protocol and now you've got eight thresholds, you know, you might need to decrease that lower than 500 milliseconds for them to ever hear the reward tone. You might need to cut it in half and maybe go to 300 milliseconds. Um, you know, you'll have to experiment with that, you know, but you will on a four channel, you're probably gonna need to lower it below 500 milliseconds. Um, you know, so you can utilize the reward latency to dial that in depending on if you're doing a one channel, two channel or four channel. Um, now the other option I found if you, if we go back to that one channel SMR, um, the other option is leave it at 500 milliseconds and just put like a high beta down or a theta down, you know, use one of those. You know, you add in that second threshold and that's gonna be enough to slow down those reward tones, you know, so your client's not basically losing their mind, you know, with a 30 minute session, constantly hearing that um, ding in their headphones. Another little trick they might try, by the way, is that when you first are working with getting that, you know, all these settings in the place you want them for that client is don't use a headset right away. Have some speakers attached up, plug the speakers in. They're going to hear the reward tone, but you're going to hear it and hear the frequency. 
and then you have a pretty good sense of it because in on average folks last i heard in richard or uh, aaron correct me if i'm wrong last i understood if you get a reward every one to two seconds that's a good rate for neurofeedback mm -hmm. yeah i would you know I've, I've heard like you know somebody comments 700 you know was an average for a 30 minute session you know so um i dr Sear would have to chime in on that if, if there's any research that tells us what's ideal or not richard he might have had a step away yeah okay, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll ask him later yeah. We'll, yeah we'll keep going no i i I've had my oh. mute on i oh. said there, <laughs> there is no research on that um at all um and you know, um we should probably write that up actually because uh at least so that it's general knowledge and uh but 500 milliseconds there is re research on and it, it's an established standard mm -hmm. and uh, and leslie sherlin as a matter of fact uh was lead author on an article that that clarified that like 10 years ago or so Good to know. All right. So as we move down, the next we have is auto artifacting. Uh, by default, we've got that set at a moderate of 75%. We can see we can go as high as 100, or we can go down and shut it off completely. Um, so for those of you that are training mostly um, adults or older teenagers, Moderate at 75% is going to be pretty good. You know, they can all follow directions. They can generally sit still fairly well. Uh, so 75% is going to be good. Now, for those of you that kind of have more pediatric um, style practices, you know, you're, you're training six, seven, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, um, we know that, you know, they are they wiggle in the chair. They move around a lot more. Um, you know, a lot of them come in with, you know, hyperactivity or attention issues. Um, so you may need to adjust your auto artifacting level to make sure they're actually getting feedback. So if you're running a session on a client, let's just say it's eyes open, um, and you're watching, and you could either watch your thresholds or you could watch their screen fading. And if you see that the thresholds aren't moving, and they're just frozen where they're at, or you see their screen is not fading in and out, um, all you have to do, if you look right up here above your raw data lines, you'll see that artifact. And it's probably just gonna be there on the screen. It's not going away. Um, it's just showing you that there is nothing but constant artifact. And this is how our software rejects artifact during a training session. Um, so during mapping, we pause the recording timer, but we can't do that for a training session or we would really mess up your guys' schedule. You know, we don't want you to set the timer for 30 minutes and then it pause, you know, the timer every time they hit artifact and next thing you know, it's a 50 minute or an hour session, you know, to get them 30 minutes of active training. So to keep your schedules on point, the way we have to reject artifact is just by pausing their feedback. So we're only providing feedback to the client when the software is seeing true EEG signals. You know, as soon as the software sees artifact present, it's gonna pause those thresholds, which in turn is gonna pause any form of feedback you're using, whether that's screen fading, audio fading, reward tones, um, and there is that possibility. You know, I've got a, a new clinic I'm training right now. She, her son is about 11 years old. He's got an issue uh, with active tics. Um, and she emailed me the other day and she's like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. You know, I was watching his session and for three quarters of the session, the screen wasn't even changing. It was just locked in darkness the whole time. You know, and that's what I had to have this conversation with her. You know, it's, it's his tick 
issue that is is creating that absence of the feedback you know so you need to slowly turn down the auto artifacting until you see that screen start to fade um, you know so anything in neurofeedback you know i never make big rash changes you know i want to step incrementally down or up you know, so I'm doing that when if I'm changing target percents to make the session harder, easier, I'm moving in small increments. And same goes with auto artifacting. I just don't want to jump right from 75% to off. Because ideally, I mean, I want to reject as much of the artifact as I possibly can to improve the quality of their session. So if I've got an adult or a child that I see the thresholds are frozen, their feedback is frozen. You know, I'm gonna maybe drop it to begin with to medium and watch to see what happens. Do my thresholds start to move again more fluidly? Do I start to see that their feedback on the screen, their brightness is changing? If the answer to that question is yes, I'm gonna leave it here. Um, if the answer is no, you know, then I'm gonna try 25% see what that does you know in a worst case scenario i'm going to shut it off you know and i'll just allow them to train um now i've i've used equipment in the past that had no auto auto artifact rejection the client still gained improvement but i do know with with the new mind system because i, I work with clinics that you know used that same equipment i did years ago um, you know, in the response I get from them moving over to NewMind is that they're astonished at how much quicker their clients now are saying they're feeling change. You know, where with that older equipment, it could have been 15 sessions before a client ever said, you know, oh, I feel this shift in, in, in my thought or my body or whatever it is. You know, and now they're hearing that in five sessions. You know, and that's because we are you know, getting rid of that artifact. We're not telling the brain anything when they produce artifact. We're only telling the brain something when it's seeing, you know, true EEG activity. And we also have to keep this auto artifacting in mind for your home trainers. You know, so it's quite common, you know, for support here to get a call or an email from somebody saying, I've got a home trainer. They're, they're brand new, and I just got a, a text or a call or whatever from mom saying, I've tried to start the session three times, it gets a couple minutes in, and then goes back to this screen that says, get connected. You know, is something broken? What's going on? It's like, nope, nothing's broken. Everything's working fine. It's your child. <laughs> your child just is a little wiggle worm. You know, they're moving around too much. Um, we kind of expect that they're a child, um, you know, so as the practitioner, you know, the solution to that is, is one, I, I would like to see if, you know, the child's doing something that we can get them to stop, you know, if they're sitting in a chair and I've seen this before, uh, you know, either in a clinic or home training, they've got the child in a chair where their feet are dangling. You know, and the kids kind of kicking their feet around, you know, and, you know, that alone could be enough, you know, to create excessive artifacts. So, you know, is the kid doing, you know, everything possible, you know, in their power, um, you know, to prevent the artifact? And if the answer is that, yes, and it's just they've got a tick disorder, you know, and that's one of the reasons why they're, you know, doing neurofeedback. Um, we're just going to have to change those settings for them, you know. So in a home training setup, if if you ever run into that, um, you know, just have the parent close down the home training software. You can go into the client's home training plan, and right in the center part of the screen at the bottom, you will see the auto artifacting, you know. And you can try just turning it down to 50%. Click the save button have the parent reopen the software and log in and try it. 
Um, if the same thing happens, they get to it's generally two minutes and around 38, 39 seconds. If it kicks them back to that get connected screen, have them close the software again. You know, drop it to 25%. Have them try it again. Um, now, you know, in, in that regard, as far as home training, this is why, like Dr. Silva down in Florida, um, I think has a great model for starting home trainers. He doesn't just send equipment to them, you know, and and, and say good luck. You know, he brings every home trainer into the clinic. He sets them up for around an hour to an hour and a half appointment. He walks them through how to connect sensors up, how to properly prep, um, how to use the software. Um, and then he actually has them do a session live in the office. Yep. You know, so if you do it that way, you would find out that day before they go home and get frustrated, you know, of if you do need to change that auto artifacting level so they can actually get a session, you can do it right there in the clinic. You, know, you can get all right. that done I there. agree with you, Aaron. And even when they're doing the brain map, if they have a suspicion that these people or they know they are going to be home trainers and they're traveling a distance, then we plan time after the map to just run a simple session based on the map and have them practice it in the office and then watch you do it and then do it themselves so that, uh, you know, it may, it may take several hours, but it saves them a lot of travel time. I agree with you. They really need to do it in the office in front of the clinician before they get that equipment home by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that way too, you can make sure they know how to properly clean the electrodes and, yep. you know, take care of the equipment, you know, and you can have that confidence when they get home that, they're going to be successful, you know, and they're not going to occupy an hour or two of your or your text time, you know, trying to troubleshoot something as simple as, you know, we, we just needed to change the auto artifacting level or, um, you know, worse yet, they're not properly attaching the sensors. You know, you can physically watch them in the clinic and, and fix any mistakes they're making while you're there. Instead of trying to watch them through, you know, a, a webcam, you know, through Zoom or, or one of those um, to try to see exactly what's going on. Yep. Well, that was uh, good stuff, Aaron. Yeah, we're at the we top of the hour hours. again, but I think we hit it all this time. I yeah, think we got we the whole training screen covered. So <laughs> great job. Great job. And as uh, he said, you should have those up hopefully over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. All right. Yep. I'll get them up today. I'll start downloading as soon as we're off the webinar. And uh, by by time I leave the office today, I'll have them posted. Um, I'll notify you all on the listserv um, as soon as they're available. So, And if you have any questions, please shoot them to Aaron or myself, and we can cover mm -hmm. those uh, the next lunch and learn when you're here. Or just sure. ask them when you're here. So, yep. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Perfect. You're welcome, sir. All right. Hope everyone has an awesome weekend. Um, yep. See you Monday night.